What is the strangest mystery that is still unsolved? An unknown group of people broke into an FBI building and no one has found out who they are. But the best part of the story is, they did it by leaving a sticky note that said, do not lock the door tonight and it worked. Edit. To everyone asking how they left the note, they just stuck the note to the front door. Probably should specified. Edit 2. I'm an approved member of r slash what's the rule now edit 3. I know it's been solved. I heard about it 8 years ago and never learned that it was solved. Imagine being the guy who left it unlocked. This is my favorite weird and barely known one. Back in 2013 an unknown group altered a power substation in California. By all appearances it was pretty sophisticated. Scouted firing positions. All casings wiped of prints. They targeted transformers, so they'd take time to overheat before triggering any alarms. Also knew exactly when the police would arrive. No suspect or motive to this day. They also cut some fiber optic cables in a vault nearby. Conspiracy types think it was a dry run by Russia or possibly China to see how effective an attack like that might be. Wikipedia. Look up a term called red cells and how they operate with NSA and DOD to protect sensitive domestic sites like power plants, airports, various gov facilities. Not a conspiracy BTW there's actually tons of info available if you look. Who was Perseus? From 1943 to 1946, the Soviet Union had a higher level spy in the Manhattan Project. Codder named Perseus, this spy was a scientist at the White Sands Missile Testing Site in NM and the main research facilities in Los Alamos. Perseus saw pretty much the entire project start to finish, giving the Russians everything they needed to get to work on their own bomb. The fact that they were able to do so within four years of the end of WWII, when their nations were still devastated, is proof positive that Perseus helped a great deal. And to top it all off, Perseus was never caught or positively identified. And to top it all off, Perseus was never caught or positively identified. That we know of. I don't think the US government would be keen to share the name of the person that sold out all their advancements to Russia. What on earth? Happened to the Trump family. So it's this Australian family who owned a berry farm. Somehow Mr. and Mrs. Trump and their three grown kids developed the belief that they weren't safe and they needed to flee their farm without cell phones or anything traceable, credit cards, etc. It sounds like the oldest son wasn't sold on whatever it was that led them to flee. He brought his phone, but eventually it got tossed from the car. He ended up bailing first and taking a train home. From there the rest of the family slowly separated and suffered various degrees of emotional breaks. The two girls stole a car. Somehow they got separated and one made it home, but the other was found on the floor in the backseat of some guy's car in a catatonic state. He spotted her after he started down the road. Eventually the parents were found wandering around aimlessly. Fortunately they were all okay physically but WTF happened? Was someone actually after them? Were they delusional? As far as I know the family hasn't released any updates. Just read about this through the article you shared. How have all those involved, the family, police, medical professionals, remained so mum on what happened? The whereabouts of the last Gestapo chief in Rich Muller. The last verified sighting of him was in Berlin roughly three days before it fell. He had stated he knew full well what the Russians did to prisoners, and he had no intentions of being captured. As chief of the Gestapo he more than likely had access to foreign documents as well as ways to replicate them. Both the CIA and the KGB spent time looking for him, but no trace has ever been found. He probably went to Argentina like the rest of the Nazis. Asher Degree. Girl leaves her house in the middle of the night during a storm and disappeared. The only problem is that she was terrified of thunder and lightning and had no motive for leaving because her home life was fine. Then her clothes and backpack were found a year later in an abandoned construction site. Is this the girl wearing all white that they think is buried in a parking lot? The USS Cyclops, a coal ship, disappeared with 306 men. The largest US Navy loss of life that didn't involve combat. Wikipedia. Of the four built, three sank without a trace. Sounds like you could solve this mystery by making a model of the ship. Nice try Netflix. You have to find interesting unsolved mysteries yourself. Naman were an agency 
I bet you can guess which one. Also clear your search history. The suicide of Ellen Greenberg. 27 stab wounds in different areas of the body. Edit. 20 stab wounds. 27 was her age at the time of death. Thanks for correcting you slash kmart4165. Suicide stabbings are so ridiculous. There's a case from Denmark in 2003 where a woman was found dead by her husband who called the police and said she had killed herself. She was on the bedroom floor next to a broken lamp, her wristwatch was torn off, and her panties pulled down, and she had 179 stab wounds. Because it was a Sunday they had to call in a criminal assistant on his off day, and he deemed it a suicide, because she had a history of depression. Will the Delphi murders ever be solved? Who was the man on the bridge behind them? Edit. Oh my goodness. My first gold thingy slash awards. Thanks. Edit 2. Here is a source you slash logreen does a good write up over at r slash true crime discussion. Although I don't think it's been updated. Reddit. I go to Delphi frequently. The police sketch of him is still hung up all over town. Which of the three astronauts aboard Apollo 10 was responsible for the floating turd? Who pooped the bunk? There are a few that bug me. The Sodder children. Their house burned down in the middle of the night. Several of the kids were presumed dead, but their bodies were never found in the debris and it never burned hot enough to cremate them. It started to look extremely suspicious and the parents, until their deaths believed that they had been taken for some reason. Many years down the line they did receive a photo and cryptic note from someone claiming to be their son, but it was never authenticated. Wikipedia the boy in the box. A deceased little boy, found beaten, recently shaved of his hair, and abandoned in the box for a bayonet that he was way too old for. The photos and reconstructions of him released to the public in the desperate hope of identifying him are haunting. Wikipedia The St. Louis Jane Doe, a little girl found in an abandoned house, decapitated and bound at the hands. They have no dental records or facial reconstruction to go from. The case has led nowhere, she's just nameless, lost to time. Wikipedia Tree State Crematory, a devastating case of a man called back from his college football career to take over his father's business when the father fell ill. Over time people started noticing bodies and body parts on the grounds, just hanging around. When someone finally took the report seriously they found that he'd been piling bodies up randomly all over the property, often when it would have been much easier to cremate them instead of hauling them around to where they were dumped. The guy gave families canisters of cement dust instead of ashes. The mystery on this one is. Why? The guy never gave up the answer to what happened there, and will only insist that there are no answers. His lawyer theorized he had mercury poisoning from cremating amalgam fillings, but that doesn't really explain why you would dump a body instead of cremating it, when the latter takes less effort. Wikipedia The West Memphis 3 case. All of the satanic panic mess obscured so much that will probably go unanswered now. A bloody man covered in mud stumbled into a bojangles the night those little boys went missing. Cops barely investigated that incident and lost the blood evidence they did collect regarding it. What was going on with John Mark Byers and Terry Hobbs, two dads of two of those kids, both turning up with evidence and acting at different points, like they may have been involved where the evil of in crap are all the severed human feet coming from Lazma Tank. A German tourist on vacation in Bulgaria, he got into a fight and the medical complications kept him from going home on a flight with his friends. Staying behind, it looks like his mental state unraveled completely over the course of a few days, increasing paranoia eventually culminating in his complete disappearance into a field of sunflowers. Culture across fire. I believe there's a decent amount of evidence that drowning victims who were wearing shoes end up separated from their feet via natural processes. The foot, encased in the shoe, was shielded from the predators and microorganisms that would have been acting on the rest of the body. That one time when the PM of Australia went to the beach. It even coined the term do the herald halt when you leave suddenly or without letting anyone know. What happened to Brian Schaffer this happened in my hometown. This med student went to a bar with friends and then fully disappeared off the face of the earth. Edit. The podcast True Crime Garage has an incredible series on this case. The hosts are both from Columbus and around Brian's age. They talk through the whole case in depth. And they also have a few guests that they talk with as well. Yes. 
how the hell did he make it out of that bar without being seen? And after losing his whole family under sad circumstances, I hope his brother gets the chance to learn what happened to Brian. The Overtown Bridge. It's a bridge in Scotland where dogs always unexplainably jump off. It's very strange and nobody knows for certain why they do this. Dogs who survived reportedly walked back up and jumped off again. They even had to put up a warning sign to keep your dog on a leash and to watch them. A lot of theorists say maybe it's because of certain scents or animals down below, but most people have disagreed with this theory. It's duck and weird. Edit. In reality, I've done more research thanks to some comments, and it seems like people have romanticized this to make it creepier than it actually is. I don't know exactly what to believe, since there's so much misinformation out there, but I'll just believe the articles who've done the most research for now. They say it was most likely not hundreds of dogs, because they can't find reports of that many jumping off like the legend says. It was only around 6. So it's likely that I was misinformed, like so many other people were, and it's not actually a huge phenomenon lol. But it's still sad and a bit weird that 6 dogs jumped off. I remember that a new theory, which is supported by most experts, has something to do with the bridge's shape and resonant frequency creating sounds only audible to dogs. These sounds mess with the dog's perception and can drive them a bit mad. As someone from Chicago who loves slash r slash unresolved mysteries I would say the maximum headroom broadcast signal intrusion, and I don't think we will ever find out who was behind it. It's been over 30 years, and we still have no idea who was behind that incredibly bizarre hijack. There was a thread a while ago of someone that thought they had figured it out that seemed very possible, but it was updated, and they were ruled out as suspects. Here is the infamous video for those that have never seen it. Just posted this, but not as eloquently. I love these kinds of mysteries harmless yet provocative, utterly pointless, truly anonymous, with some real skill and creativity. That guy who ran away from the airport hopped the fence and was never seen again. Just read the wiki article on him. My money would be firmly on him having copped a sudoral hematoma in the arm out. Shame his friends didn't stay, they'd almost certainly have picked that something wasn't right, taken him back to hospital, and he'd have got a court, and then probably surgery to relieve it. For those wondering how it ties together, sudorals are slow bleeds of veins inside your head, often from a traumatic injury that can keep bleeding, and slowly over days, can build enough pressure to cause pretty nasty symptoms. And paranoia slash hallucination slash personality changes are definitely some of them. Source, doctor, seen quite a few, but only ever with more strokey symptoms, and never the batch's mad symptoms. The guy's motive for shooting up all those people in Vegas. This one has bothered me for quite some time as well. The guy had no criminal record, no history of mental illness, no known religious or political affiliations, was financially well off, and no known relationship issues. Very strange indeed. The boat's void is a region of outer space that contains no galaxies or stars and we don't know why. According to Wikipedia there are 60 known galaxies, where there should be around 2000. Not quite zero, but interesting either way. Oh god, here I go on another 2 hour binge of reading every comment in the thread. It's 1am, I get scared reading these things and I can't stop, help. The Tam Shud case, also known as the mystery of the Summerton man, is an unsolved case of an unidentified man found dead at 6.30am. The 1st of December 1948, on the Somerton Park Beach, just south of Adelaide, South Australia. The case is named after the Persian phrase Tamshud, meaning ended or finished, which was printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the fob pocket of the man's trousers. The scrap had been torn from the final page of a copy of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, authored by 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. Tam was misspelt as Tam in many early reports, and this error has often been repeated, leading to confusion about the name in the media. Definition Cold War Spiches. No doubt. It was around the time of nuclear testing in South Australia, all the stuff they found on him, and at the train station being untraceable slash having no identification tags. The book was probably part of Cypher. They may exhume him soon. The main dude at Adelaide Uni studying the case married into the family suspected of being associated with the man. It's a weird world. 
testing was several years after he was found dead. But the spy theory involves a uranium mine and the Woomera testing range. At the start of lots of chapters of the Quran there are mysterious groups of letters. No one knows what they mean. Although there are lots of theories, Wikipedia. Thank you for posting something new, that's quite interesting. The Salish Sea Feet or the Mad Axemen of New Orleans. The Salish Sea Feet are the approximately 20 dismembered feet found in or around British Columbia or Washington, USA. The feet sometimes are found still inside of shoes. No one knows how they got there or where they came from. Over the course of the last 13 years, the authorities have ruled out foul play. The Mad Axeman of New Orleans ran rampant in 1918 and 1919. He murdered six people, usually those of Italian descent, with axes or straight razors. In March of 1919, he sent a lengthy letter from hottest hell that was pretty nonsensical. But the most relevant paragraphs read, now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to par over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is, I'm very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions, that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain and that is, that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. There were no murders that night, because every dance hall in Nala was filled to capacity. Clearly just a jazz musician who was really down on his luck, and was willing to do anything to get a gig. The hint of Kfec murders. Super creepy in the fact, that there was evidence the murderers were in the house watching the family for a while, before killing them just totally freaks me out edit. Thanks for the silver. First time award recipient here. And gold too. Happy almost cake day to me. Are you familiar with the book The Man From The Train? The writers think that it was a serial killer, German guy, that killed a bunch of families in the United States before going back to Germany. Three lighthouse workers with impeccable mustaches traveled to a remote island on December 7, 1900 for a lighthouse shift that should have lasted for two weeks. When a boat arrived to pick them up, they were gone. No trace of the bodies, and the lighthouse was strangely locked. Not only was the setting normal, meal ready to be served, but there was no fire in the fireplace, and the clock stopped. One of the men kept a log in a diary, and he said that the seas were off one day, but when monitored, it was actually calm. No one knows what happened to them. Source Source 2 skipped a 443 edit, the mustaches have nothing to do with the story at all. I just really liked them. Freak wave, almost certainly, been to Flannan, lovely place. Courtesy of a local fisherman who told me all about this mystery and frankly, scared the living heck out of me. I'll share what he told me, most of which checks out with records of the time. During the search for those quite wonderful missing moustaches the following was noted. One slasher box over 100 feet above sea level had been wave damaged, and iron railings at the same level had been bent. Two slash the railway lines serving the lighthouse had been ripped out of their concrete settings. Three slash and this is my favorite bit. There is a nearby cliff over 200 feet high. It was still there, but the grass on top of the cliff had been ripped away. For up to 30 feet back from the cliff edge. Arguing that that was where the wave broke. The local view is that by freak chance all the keepers were outside and below the 200 feet above sea level mark doing keeper stuff when they suddenly noticed it had gone dark and looked up just in time to see a wave over 200 feet high about to hit them. Probably had time to say something along the lines of goodness gracious me, and now I'll never have time to finish that letter to Martha and that would be it. How TF Jesus found people in the Middle East named Mark, Matthew, Luke, ADN John. Those are just the English dub names. In the Organum they were named something else, but they had to Americanize it because the Japanese names would be too hard for Americans to understand. Malaysian Flight 370. Here's a really good video and sort of gives us probably the closest answer we will get Yao to. The identity of and what happened to D.B. Cooper. A man on a plane called himself D.B. Cooper and claimed to have a bomb in use suitcase. 
he took the flight crew hostage, and when he got the money he asked for he had the flight crew start flying again. Eventually he jumped out of the plane with a couple of parachutes and the money. No one knows where he went, or if he even survived. I've told this on Reddit before. We lived near SeaTac Airport, my dad often went by DB. Our last name was a navigator in the Air Force so could guide pilots by the stars and worked for Boeing. Even crazier, his appearance was not unlike Cooper's and Cooper was part of his mother's maiden name. Spoiler alert, it wasn't my dad, but the part that has always amazed my family is that the FBI came calling just a day or two after it happened. This was way before the internet of course, or computerized databases I think, so how did they make the connection so quickly? Pretty impressive, we've always thought. MV Joyata, barnacle growth high above the usual waterline on the port side showed that Joyata had been listing heavily for some time. There was some damage to the superstructure. Her flying bridge had been smashed away, and the deckhouse had light damage and broken windows. A canvas awning had been rigged on top of the deckhouse behind the bridge. Joyata carried a dinghy and three Carly life rafts, three, but all were missing. She did not carry enough life jackets for everyone on board. 7 The starboard engine was found to be covered by mattresses, while the port engine's clutch was still partially disabled, showing that the vessel was still running on only one engine. An auxiliary pump had been rigged in the engine room, mounted on a plank of wood slung between the main engines. However, it had not been connected. The radio on board was tuned to the International Distress Channel, but when the equipment was inspected, a break was found in the cable between the set and the aerial. The cable had been painted over, obscuring the break. This would have limited the range of the radio to about 2 miles, 3, 2 kilometers. The electric clocks on board, wired into the vessel's generator, had stopped at 10.25 and the switches for the cabin lighting and navigation lights were on, implying that whatever had occurred happened at night. The ship's logbook, sex and mechanical chronometer and other navigational equipment, as well as the firearms Miller kept in the boat, seven, were missing. A doctor's bag was found on deck, containing a stethoscope, a scalpel, and four lengths of blood-stained bandages. Sounds to me like it had been damaged in a collision. People initially tried to patch it up, then got scared, probably due to the heavy listing, and decided to abandon it on the dinghy and life rafts. They probably made distress calls that remained unheard due to the antenna problem and ended up lost adrift, like many sailors before them. People precipitously abandoning ships or camps in a mar panic is likely the explanation to many such mysteries, like the Mary Celeste or even Diat Lavpa. The Khan Kalapar in Ladakh this region lies in the disputed border of India and China and is truly the most inaccessible places in the world. In 1962, the armies of both the countries were engaged in a severe conflict. After this, both China and India entered into an agreement according to which none will be allowed to patrol the region, but can keep an eye on it from a distance. After this, a popular belief floated that the Khan Kalapar in Ladakh is a hideous base of UFOs. The area has forever remained a no man's land due to its territorial limits and is a reason why the UFOs have chosen it as their operational base. Reportedly, many have seen these UFOs and both the Indian and Chinese governments are aware of these developments. In 2006, Google Maps 2 baffled the world with some images that looked like military facilities, but till date the whole issue remains mysterious and unexplainable. I just did some googling, and seems China is pulling troops out of there today. I looked on Google Earth, and it seems super remote. Is it the mountains that make it so inaccessible? Literally any dig site in archaeology, even the ones that are just garbage in pot sherds are fascinating, if you try to really picture the people behind them, what they thought and felt. Actually, garbage probably tells you more about a people than anything else, really. Archaeology major but my favorite is Chorvat Cave. If you have a chance, watch Werner Herzog's documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams. I think it's still on Netflix. It has some of the most stunning cave art in the world, which almost certainly had some kind of profound significance, and we don't, and will likely never, know what it is. Moreover, there's evidence that the cave was abandoned for thousands of years and later returned to, only for the retinues, to continue to make paintings in the exact same style, and, possibly, for the exact same reasons. 
there is so much to be seen in these figures. There's a portrait of an animal tossing its head that looks like one of the world's earliest explorations of stop motion or sequential art. When I look at it, I can feel the will of the painter who wanted so much to convey this sort of motion. There are also the footprints of a boy who arrived much later to the cave than its original users, whose marks appear to be contemporary with the paw prints of a wolf. It's hard to say now, according to Cave of Forgotten Dreams, whether they walked together, whether they walked 20 years apart, whether they were friends, or whether the wolf was stalking the boy. But I read a blog post by a professional hunter and tracker who looked at the footage of the prints from the film and said that they likely walked together. I wonder what they were thinking. If the boy had some knowledge of what he would find there, or if he was simply exploring a cave and found some of the greatest art in human history. In Chorvet there is also the solution to a mystery. Until the discovery of Chorvet Cave paleontologists were unsure as to where the cave lions had manes. On the cave walls there is an illustration of a cave lion with visible testicles and no mane, settling that debate. If you would like to visit the cave, there is a 3D tour available here. I love the pay and you have for archaeology. I've never thought about it in this light. Thank you for enlightening me. Why people keep pouring money into a hole in the ground on Oak Island, if you ask me. The show is a treasure. They rake in that sweet advertising money, while not actually doing much more than recap past events and share about 15 minutes of new content. In 1977 we received a radio signal from outer space that lasted about 72 seconds. To this day, we still do not know where it originated from. The wow signal, no. What's crazy is that the signal lasted 72 seconds because we only had the recording capabilities for 72 seconds. It went on longer. In 1994, close to 100 schoolchildren, 60 on record, described seeing a disc-shaped craft land behind their school during morning break time in Ruwa, Zimbabwe. Many of them interacted with beings that fit the grey alien description, with the children receiving what is described as some sort of telepathic communication. They all still stick to their stories today. Example 1, Example 2, Example 3. Here is the original footage of the interviews with the kids at the school, YouTube, 30 minutes. This is incredibly interesting, and I truly find it to be the most legit UFO case ever recorded in history. Nearly a hundred children who all telepathically spoke to an alien being are able to explain a consistent story with complex ideas that they have a difficult time even explaining. The 1987 Arkansas murders of Don Henry and Kevin Ives and every single possible witness surrounding them, like Keith McCaskill, who claimed to be on the tracks that night. He talked to the special prosecutor about what he saw, then realized the prosecutor was dirty. After coming forth as a witness he began saying goodbye to his loved ones and planned his own funeral arrangements. Shortly after he was stabbed 113 times. Death of Rhea Rivera. Found dead in a meeting room in a hotel. Fell through the roof. The last call he received was from his office, but the company placed all employees under a gag order so no one can talk to police. How does a company place employees under a gag order in criminal investigations? Where the duck are all the 10mm sockets going into hiding? Possibly an underground city just for them? Some company should make a mechanics tool set that's just like a dozen 10mm sockets. Flight 19 of December 5, 1945. Five bomber craft on a routine training run became lost while heading back and eventually disappeared entirely. Audio has them saying that they thought they had ended up over the Florida Keys, but wind could not have allowed that. Even more interesting is the fact the rescue craft dispatched to locate them also disappeared. Yeah to it explains well here. Of course, video from Limino. The toxic death of Gloria Ramirez. 23 people became ill due to her mere presence and 5 were hospitalized. We have never worked out what happened. There's an episode of the Stuff You Should Know podcast that talks about it. About 8.15pm. On the evening of February 19, 1994, Ramirez, suffering from severe heart palpitations, was brought into the emergency department of Riverside General Hospital by paramedics. She was extremely confused and was suffering from tachycardia and Chin Stokes respiration. The medical staff injected her with diazepam, 
Midazolam, and lorazepam to sedate her. When it became clear that Ramirez was responding poorly to treatment, the staff tried to defibrillate her heart. At that point several people saw an oily sheen covering Ramirez's body, and some noticed a fruity garlic-like odor that they thought was coming from her mouth. A registered nurse named Susan Kane attempted to draw blood from Ramirez's arm and noticed an ammonia-like smell coming from the tube. She parted the syringe to Julie Gorkinski, a medical resident, who noticed manila-colored particles floating in the blood. At this point, Kane fainted and was removed from the room. Shortly thereafter, Gorkinski began to feel nauseated. Complaining that she was life-aided, she left the trauma room and sat at a nurse's desk. A staff member asked her if she was okay, but before she could respond she also fainted. Maureen Welsh, a respiratory therapist who was acting in the trauma room was the third to par out. The staff was then ordered to evacuate all emergency department patients to the parking lot outside the hospital. Overall, 23 people became ill and 5 were hospitalized. A skeleton crew stayed behind to stabilize Ramirez. At 8.50 p.m., after 45 minutes of CPR and defibrillation, Ramirez was pronounced dead from kidney failure related to her cancer. She was using a chemical used as degreaser as a pain reliever which in her body was too warm to change form. Outside of her body it crystallized and out of a gas that affected those around her. Why did they stop making the groove nerf turbo football? Why Burger King didn't make the smokehouse cheddar burger a permanent menu item? The Voynich Manuscript. Nobody knows if it's legit or just an elaborate joke. Edit. You can look at it here. Archive. It's a cookbook. It's a cookbook. I will forever post about my great aunt Wendy's come up. Where is Kimberly Langwell? She disappeared in 1999 in Beaumont, Texas. Her car was found in the parking lot of an Eckerd's drug store, but her person keys were missing. Her cell phone was inside. We all know she wouldn't have left her daughter, Tiffany, just like that. She loved her and loved life and those who surrounded her. Everyone who knew Kimberly loved her. She was the shining star on a dark night. If you have seen her alive, please call the police. I have posted her case below. Charlie Project. I'm in Beaumont and research missing women in this area and the Houston area. I think about her every time I par that area of Felon slash Dowlin. The Circleville Letters in 1976. Residents of the small city south of Columbus, Ohio began receiving handwritten sinister and graphic letters. Each letter included secret and dark details about their personal lives. One resident received a ton of letters, accusing her of various unsavory acts. The author warned the resident that he had been keeping an eye on her home, as well as her comings and goings. The resident was horrified and tried to keep the letters a secret until her husband began receiving them. The attacks on the family continued, with large posters appearing around town spreading rumors about their 12-year-old child. One day in 1977, the husband left the house after receiving a call from who he thought was writing the letters. A few minutes later, the husband was found dead at the end of the street dead behind the wheel. The sheriff had ruled it a homicide when he realized that a single shot had been fired before the accident, but there was no evidence that the husband was shot at the site. The sheriff found the husband was twice the legal limit and ruled it a drunk driving accident. The letters began once again, this time accusing the sheriff of covering up the true nature of the death. The letters also accused the sheriff of mishandling an investigation into the county coroner, who had been accused of other grotesque acts. The harriment continued, this time with signs along the road, and in 1983, the original resident who had been accused of having an affair pulled over to remove a sign. During the effort to remove the sign, she discovered a box was attached, and inside of it was a small pistol. The gun was part of a booby trap designed to fire when the sign was removed. Paul Fresher was arrested and given 25 years. But one small problem. The letter writing continued even after Fresher was put in jail. In a new batch of letters, the author had promised to dig up the grave of a deceased baby and mail the bones to the police in the case of another potential affair turned murder. Hundreds of residents continued to receive personal letters until 1994 when everything stopped. This is interesting. Would make for a good movie as well perhaps. Zodiac-ish style. The Cancer Paradox. 
it's about creatures, like elephants and blue whale, and how they don't get cancer, when they should be more prone to it. Edit. Holy thanks for 2k upvotes. I like. Elephants have extra copies of certain genes, that create the cells that destroy mutated cells, which is why they don't get cancer. A strange but not creepy mystery, the disappearance and reappearance of Lawrence Joseph Bader. He was a cooper salesman from Akron, Ohio who went missing in 1957. He went fishing, a storm hit, and his boat was found the next day with some damage. He was in debt, and in trouble with the eyes and his wife was about to have their third child. Four days later, John Fritz Johnson appeared in a bar in Omaha, Nebraska. Spoiler, it's Larry Bader. Fritz was known for his wild personality, he attracted local attention for sitting atop a flagpole for 30 days to raise money for polio. He became a radio announcer and a TV sports director. He drove around in a hearse with a bar and became a minor celebrity in Omaha. By no means was avoiding attention. In 1964, a cancerous tumor was found behind his left eye and it had to be removed. In 1965, Fritz was in Chicago for a tournament and an acquaintance from Akron recognized him, despite the eye patch, and confronted him, and then brought Bader's niece to take a look. She agreed it was her uncle, and confronted him about it as well. Fritz denied it, but found it humorous. Fritz's fingerprints were then matched to Larry Bader's military records, and it was confirmed. Fritz Johnson always maintained he had no memory of his former life as Larry Bader. Psychiatrists examined him and believed he was telling the truth, even though he had financial reasons to warm a new identity and the concept of someone forgetting their past and entirely constructing a different one with false memories is hard to fathom. It is also considered a possibility that the eye tumor had something to do with it. He ultimately died in 1966 from the eye tumor and it was never determined conclusively whether he was lying or not. I'm fascinated by this case, especially because he had an entire change in personality, an entire life backstory as Fritz, and he made no effort to live a low profile to avoid discovery. I found this case while looking through the Wikipedia category of people who have faked their own deaths, though it's debatable if this guy should even be on there. All of which are great stories. The human brain is an amazing thing. It is equal parts frightening and impressive. Greek fire. As someone with an unhealthy fascination with the Byzantine Empire it is a mystery, but not quite as mysterious as people make it out to be. Some ingredients are known, and some of its properties could easily be replicated using materials available to people in medieval Greece. I like crude oil from Anatolia, was a known ingredient, also some form of resin was involved, this would have allowed it to burn quite ferociously, and be difficult to put out. However one property, that isn't commonly mentioned, is that some sources describe it as giving off thunder and smoke also, I'm too lazy to find my source, but there was one account of a container of Greek fire going off at a Byzantine military encampment, apparently the resulting blast lit up the entire camp, and could be here from a great distance. There are also accounts of the flamethrowers that use the stuff generating recoil I like. It's been a while since I read up on this, so I might not be remembering that right. To me this is the most mysterious part, since explosives were not adopted in Europe until centuries after the introduction of Greek fire. Had they discovered some early form of gunpowder it is also likely that they would have eventually developed other uses for it. Greek fire actually was used for several types of weapons, but not in the way that gunpowder was. This essentially implies that whatever made Greek fire slightly explosive was not easily adaptable to things such as cannons or firearms, and it didn't make a good propellant except for itself. No chemical with such properties was known in the Middle Ages to anyone near the Byzantine Empire. In other words they found a way to make a mystery explosive that has seemingly no connection to later ones, or mean that the accounts of explosive Greek fire are true, otherwise it was likely just a mix of oil and resin. Who killed Jeffrey Epstein? We will be asking who killed Ghislaine Maxwell very soon too. She was just put on suicide watch. Ken McElroy's murder. This dad checker no terrorized an entire town until the town decided that they had enough and then somebody shot him in broad daylight in front of a bunch of witnesses. To be fair, he probably deserved it. 
but what makes it interesting is that everyone claims to have had their eyes closed or be tying their shoe at the time or something so oh boy, I wish I could help officer, but I didn't see anything. Wikipedia. The real mystery there is how you get that many people to cooperate in one lie. Damn he must have been the greatest a-hole of all time. Albert Johnson, the mad trapper of Rat River. A pretty cool mostly forgotten story about a man chased by the RCMP through the north. Dude was ducking tough. How her snap score went up while she's been in the shower for the past 141 weeks. I think she's snapping pictures of the shower head emo. On April 19, 1995, a truck bomb detonated outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The explosion killed 168 in what was the deadliest terrorist attack on the United States until 9 over 11. To date, it still remains the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in the country. One of the less known things about this is the case of the missing leg. Investigators discovered the leg laying among the rubble and identified it belonging to Lakish Levy. The only problem was, she'd already been buried with both her legs. She was exhumed, her severed leg was placed in her coffin, while the other leg was taken to the FBI laboratory for identification. Since it had been embalmed, a DNA sample was unable to be obtained. The extra left leg, which had been mistakenly buried with Levy, is suspected to belong to an unidentified 169th victim, whose body had mostly disintegrated in the blast. This has lead people to suspect there was an additional terrorist involved, even though perpetrators Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols had been convicted, with two others later identified as accomplices. So who was the possible additional bomber? They still remain unidentified now 25 years after the attack. Night times. I remember this bombing so well due to all the coincidental connections I had with it. My uncle worked across the street in an office with a window view. He took that day off, and his office was covered in glass from the explosion. His son was one of the federal marshals that escorted Timothy McVeigh back to OKC and fingerprinted him. My GF at the time was questioned by the FBI because she was buying dog food at the coop at approximately the same time they were buying the fertilizer for the bomb. The identity of Jack the Ripper. Yeah there are so many questions and theories surrounding this one. It would be neat to know once and for all who it was. We still have no definitive proof of who this Socrates guy is. On one hand, he's mentioned constantly by philosophers from his time, often used as an example character, and several works are attributed to his name. On the other hand, we have countless legal records and censuses that confirm the existence of Aristotle and Plato but none that link back to Socrates. He's either a very prolific philosopher or an in-joke that clinical philosophers would reference when they didn't know who to attribute quotes to. We do know he was blackballed by the government to kill himself. Wouldn't that be enough to suggest that they got rid of those legal documents? Another one is Colonel Philip Shue's death. On April 16, 2003, 54-year-old Colonel Philip Shue left his Texas home and headed to work. Two hours later, he was found dead in his car, an apparent victim of a car crash. The car was caved in on the driver's side and Philip suffered major head trauma as a result. He was killed instantly. This is where it gets weird. Philip had a tear in his t-shirt under his fatigues. There, they could see a 6-inch vertical gash in his chest. Above the entrance to the 6 gash were at least 5 scratch marks, which the autopsy report said were consistent with hesitant marks. Both his nipples had been removed with surgical precision. The fifth digit on his left hand had been amputated, and his left ear had been lacerated down to the bone. Duct tape was dangling from both of his wrists and the top of his boots. It was ruled a suicide. His nipples? A 8 year old kid says he was killed with a axe. The kid brought them to the exact location, and after some digging they found an axe and remains. The kid tell the police who killed him, and after interrogation he admits to killing someone. No one knows how the kid knew all this. Any possibility that he saw the actual murder and the trauma made him think that it was himself being murdered? What happened to D.B. Cooper? My favorite theory is that D.B. Cooper emerged decades later as Tommy Wiseau. The Lady of the Dunes. No one knows who she is. It's a pretty crazy story. 
Stephen King's son Joe Hill made a theory that she was an extra in the movie Jaws, since a woman in the background of the movie looks very similar to her and can be seen in the same clothes the Lady of the Dunes. It makes a lot of sense, but doesn't really explain who killed her or anything. Who killed John Bernard Ramsey? This is the one that bugs me the most. How is this still unsolved? The theory that the brother did it and the parents protected him is a pretty good theory, but how could investigators fail to find any proof of that? Who is Cartier? What is Obama's last name? The Winchester Mystery House. I watched a documentary on this house when I was 10 and it has stuck with me ever since. It's about a woman named Sarah Winchester. Her husband and baby both died. Her husband owned a rifle company and she went to a psychic. The psychic told her that she is being haunted by the ghosts of all the people who have died by the hands of those guns, and that is a reason for the tragedy that happened in her life. To appease the spirits, the psychic told her to build a great house for them, and she was not allowed to stop building, or tragedy will strike again. She didn't get help from anyone, but she did it, and kept building for the next 38 years. There are stairs that lead to nowhere, windows that don't look out, hallways that wrapped around. It has 161 rooms and it's huge. Was it really the ghosts? Was she insane? I have no idea, but it's the most interesting story I've ever heard. I honestly think it's just some rich lady who was traumatized by the death of her loved ones and did everything she could to stop it from happening again. No mystery, just a fascinating story on how our brains work. The Oakville Blob. In 1994, there was a rainstorm in Oakville, Washington, only the raindrops were a strange clear substance that had the consistency of jello. Lots of people experienced flu-like symptoms after coming into contact with it, and people's dogs and cats all over the city were dying. When a local hospital ran a lab test on the substance after one of the patients suggested it, it was found that whatever this mysterious rain was, it had human white blood cells in it. Some time after that, a sample was also sent to the Washington State Health Laboratory, where it was being researched by epidemiologist Mike McDowell. After he determined that it was man-made and speculated that it was some sort of matrix for transporting viruses slash bacteria, the samples suddenly went missing from the containment facility and his supervisor told him not to ask any questions. There are no known samples of the stuff anywhere today, despite being sent to several different facilities by various Oakville residents. So yeah, I'd personally say that this was clearly some sort of bioweapon test run, but by whom? I'd like to give the US government the benefit of the doubt here, and or it wasn't us testing something like that on our own citizens, but if it wasn't, why would it have been covered up like that? And you'd think an event like this would be a lot less obscure. Also, even if it being a bio weapon seems super obvious, how the heck did whoever dispersed it manage to make it rain over an entire city for several days? You give them too much credit. There have been several incidents that have come to light in the last few years or decades that involve the US Gov directly testing weapons and or medicine on the unwitting and unsuspecting populace. Operation Sea Spray in San Francisco comes to mind. Also, they did something similar in the Chicago subways at some point. Also shared where they sprayed toxic substances on ships with thousands of unprepared sailors on board. Edit, Wikipedia has an amazing list of the known bulches the US Gov has pulled in this similar fashion. Wikipedia. That one where there was a shooting at agenda, reveal party only for it to turn out that the person throwing the party had faked the pregnancy. I just want to know why for so many things. This was solved. I live about 10 miles from this location. The answer is drugs. Carl Reynizich's hole. And it made local news, but I guess not national, that the boyfriend was involved in a drug deal that went sideways earlier in the week. The shooting was retribution. On mobile so can't locate the link, but pull up WLWT.com and search their stories. The Sodder Children FFS. I think it was the insurance salesman that had tried to sell them stuff right before the fire. He apparently threatened them that their house would go up in smoke or something to that effect. Why does it take three tries to correctly plug USB in? I, for one, welcome our new USB-C overlords. 
the suicide of Lavina Johnson a black female US Army private who was found shot to death inside a burning tent with a broken nose, black eyes, broken teeth, raped and acid burns on her genitals in July 2005. US Army ruled her death a suicide. There was a whole podcast episode about this on crime junkies and it seriously swayed me into no longer looking into going into the military. What a ducking disgrace you can serve your country honorably without potentially falling victim to being raped and or murdered by your own damn comrades. This infuriates me. Epstein and the global billionaire political pedophile child sex trafficking ring. Maura Murray and the Springfield 3. Would love both of the missing persons cases to be solved in my lifetime. Also, a local guy went missing after a car accident in 2011. Would like answers on that as well. Springfield 3 for sure. I think Maura Murray died in the woods. But how do three adult women all disappear from a home in a span of several hours? How in a country of over 300 million people, the US, can't find any better presidential candidates. The most qualified people, who would make the best president in history, are too smart to want to be president. Spontaneous human combustion. It is a real thing, or at least there is some kind of phenomenon, that has occurred through documented, and even eyewitness cases. The strangest part is, that the fires burn hot enough to completely destroy the body, yet the surrounding environment experiences little damage. Though there are many theories, we don't know how it actually happens. It is extremely rare. The podcast Unexplained Mysteries did a good two-part episode on it. Here's part two that goes into the theories about spontaneous human combustion. When I was little, I accidentally saw the X-Files episode on spontaneous combustion and was terrified of randomly bursting into flames for the next few years. The true author of my immortal a horrible fanfiction that has a cult following. The more you dive into it the weirder and deeper the mystery gets. Interconnected webs, false flags, all kind of stuff. I don't think the real author can ever be revealed. There have been too many false flags already, and the story itself is a decade old. If I remember correctly, the author's fanfic net account doesn't exist anymore, and the ML account it was created with got deleted or something. That and the false flags would make it impossible to prove the authenticity of the author, even if they decided to come forward. Personally, I think it was satire. But I do really like the thought of some normal, 25 year old woman living amongst us, cringing every once in a while at the memory of her fanfic past. The Miyazawa family. Just listen to the Casophile podcast on this, and it has my mind blown. Someone entered the family home around 11.30pm, killed everyone, ate some ice cream, took a nap, pooped and didn't flush, changed clothes and left like 8 hours after the crime. 20 years on, and we don't know who, or why, would there not be a load of DNA from the killer in the poop? The Diat Love Par incident. So there's 6 things that freak people out about this one. 1. The No Tongue Woman 2. A mysterious orange tan on the dead bodies 3. The Rip Tents 4. The Hiker's Lack of Clothing 5. The Crushing Damage Done to 3 of the Hiker's 6. The traces of radioactivity the big fact that gets lost in the retelling of this story is that the bodies weren't found until weeks later. It's not like somebody turned their back, then 5 minutes later all their friends were dead and half naked. That makes the missing tongue a lot easier to explain. As disturbing as it may be, the first thing a scavenging animal is going to go for is probably the soft tissue of an open mouth, especially if it still smelled like the burrito the hiker just ate. Laying out in the sun, surrounded by white snow for days also accounts for the weird tan. The trauma in the destroyed tent points to an avalanche. Their state of undress can be explained by paradoxical undressing, a known behavior of hypothermia victims, when their brains start to freeze and malfunction. In other words, it's the kind of behavior you'd expect from a group of injured avalanche victims wandering around in the middle of the night in the freezing cold. What about the radioactivity? Or stranger details that turn up in some accounts, like orange lights in the sky? Well, there's the fact that none of that stuff turns up in the original documents from the incident and appears to have been added later by people who just can't resist making things spookier than they are. It's those later accounts that have stuck in the public memory because so many of the original reports were destroyed. This was the Cold War era Soviet Union 
which treated Carol recipes as state secrets. So none of the details on their own prove anything other than a tragic hiking accident. The conspiracy-loving public widely reject this, too busy lighting their torches and getting their pitchforks to go hunt down an unknown compelling force. The actual date of the creation of the Great Sphinx of Egypt. It's likely thousands of years older than Egyptologists would have you believe. Project Cicada or something. Cicada 3301. Limino made an excellent video about it. I love cold cases. There's something so creepy yet so fascinating about an unsolved murder, especially if it was a high profile case or a case that happened a long time ago. My personal favorite cold case is the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson, because it was both high profile and happened over 20 years ago, yet it remains unsolved to this day. It's my favorite cold case to research, and I hope to live to see the case solved and the murderer brought to justice. Her ex-husband has dedicated his life to finding her real killers. The Tylenol murders from the 1980s where like 5 or 6 people from Chicago consumed Tylenol laced with cyanide and died. They had one suspect, but he want mail for it, but still went to prison because they tried to extort Johnson & Johnson, the company that makes Tylenol. Edit, autocorrect sucks. My mom had bought Tylenol at the exact jewel that day. It was actually in Arlington Heights, a Chicago suburb. She hadn't opened it yet. There were cars going up and down the street with bullhorns warning people to throw it out. I was two at the time. Crazy. I read this in a book called Stranger Than Science published in the late 50s that purportedly recounted baffling true stories. I had to root around for it, but man if it is true it is one of the strangest things I've ever heard, copied and pasted from here, on the afternoon of September 23rd, 1880, on a farm just a few miles outside of Gallatin, Tennessee, a remarkable and unexplained event was witnessed by five people. The farm was occupied by David Lang and his family, his wife, Emma, his two children, 8-year-old George and 11-year-old Sarah, and their household servants. On that afternoon, the children were playing in the front yard when Mr. and Mrs. Lang came out of their house and Mr. Lang started across the pasture toward his quarter horses. As Lang was crossing the pasture, the horse and buggy of the family's friend, Judge August Peck, came into view on the lane in front of the house. The children stopped playing, as Peck always brought them presents when he visited. Both Mr. and Mrs. Lang saw the buggy and Mr. Lang waved to the judge as he turned to walk back towards the house. Then David Lang completely disappeared in mid-step. David Lang had just suddenly ceased to exist. This was fully witnessed by his two children, his wife, Judge August Peck, and the judge's traveling companion, the judge's brother-in-law, understandably, Mrs. Lang screamed. All five witnesses ran to the spot they had last seen Mr. Lang, but there was nothing to hide behind or under, the field contained just short crap. The adults quickly searched the field for other possible clues, but to no effect. Mrs. Lang soon became hysterical and was taken back into the house as neighbors were called with an alarm bell. By nightfall, all the neighbors were involved in the search and, by lantern, they checked every foot of the field, stamping their feet to try to detect any caves, holes, or cracks that Mr. Lang might have fallen into. Nothing was found. In the weeks following the strange disappearance, Mrs. Lang was bedridden with shock. All the family servants except the cook, Suki, left the house. Curiosity seekers were being chased away from the farm by the local authorities. The county surveyor confirmed that the field was on perfectly solid ground, with no caves or sinkholes. No one had any answers for what happened. Months after the event, in 1881, Lang's children noticed that the grass at the site of their father's disappearance had grown strange and yellow. It formed a circle with a 15-foot diameter. Sarah called to her father, and, seemingly as a result, both the children heard him faintly calling for help, over and over, until his voice faded away. Mrs. Lang never fully recovered. There was never a funeral or memorial service for Mr. Language. Mrs. Lang eventually left the farm and allowed Judge Peck to rent it out, with the exception of the field in the front of the house. That pasture was left unto shade as long as she lived. What had happened to David Lang? 
In the years since, many authors have guessed, possibly Lang was an abduction by fairies or UFOs, perhaps he somehow fell into a different dimension of existence, or perhaps he somehow had the very atoms of his body suddenly break into their component parts and simply cease to exist, but all of it are just guesses. In the end, there just isn't any way to ever know for sure where the missing farmer went. Edit, so there seems to be debate about whether this is true or a hoax. All I'll say is I read the story 20 some odd years ago and it has stuck with me. Now I'm reading through and it sounds like a hoax, which had I known sooner it could have saved me 20 years of nightmares. Also, I fixed the formatting because of complaints. Sorry y'all, new Aish poster. David Lang has left the game. Why is there something instead of nothing? Yes it hurts to think what would the universe be without anything, or why everything started. The death of John Language. He was a journalist who lived in Fresno, California and he reported on the police's extortion of the poor. The police started camping outside his house and several mysterious vehicles repeatedly circled his street. Eventually his house burned down and he died. His channel is on Yautab and his CCTV footage is all up there available for your perusal. After seeing how the Minneapolis PD tried to cover up George Floyd's death, they fabricated the results of his autopsy, it doesn't make this story seem like that much of a far cry from reality. That video where they point that thing at his house from a van is straight up horrifying. The Universal S. The one we drew in elementary school. It could be anywhere from decades old to thousands of years old. Oh my. You watched until the end? That's ducking awesome dude. Thanks for watching.